I've been at this job for over 20 years now, and never have I experienced anything as ghastly as this. Sure, there's been times when being a trucker you have to sleep in risky spots, places where you might not normally want to park up for the night, but the law doesn't give you that choice. This story, it's a memory I hold close, not because I'm fond of it, but because of what it reminds me of. Since it happened, I plan out every route down to the minute, to the very meter of road ahead. Since then, I found myself sleeping in much safer places. Some could call it a blessing in disguise. I call it trauma. Two years ago, I was driving along my delivery route through a 30-mile stretch of a tunnel of nothing but trees and darkness, when all of a sudden I realized it had been just over three hours and was coming up to the four-hour mark. Legally, I had to stop and rest on the fourth hour and I wasn't planning on taking the risk of having my trucker's license removed. Besides, I'd had worse. At least, that's what I thought. I was so naive. Soon enough, as I was just minutes from the four-hour mark, I spotted a small lay-by on the road ahead. As I turned into it, I was filled with joy to see that it opened out into a small little field. I drove in. I was setting up for the night brushing my teeth and whatnot when I heard the rumble of an engine come rumbling down from the road. The stream I was brushing my teeth at was just by. My truck was sat just a couple of meters behind me. As the bright lights of the oncoming car grew closer, I became suspicious of it. It had rapidly slowed down whilst driving beside me. I stared at the blacked out windows as it crawled on past me. I spat out my toothpaste and hurried back inside the confines of my truck, closing the door only when I had seen it disappear behind the tree line. Once I shut the door, I did the traditional trucker thing and tied the seatbelt around the door handle for extra security. It's a tried and tested trucker method of keeping yourself safer in sketchy areas. Tried and tested again that very same night. After pulling all the curtains closed and in deep need of some rest, I crawled into bed, pulled the covers over me, and in seconds I was fast asleep. I awoke what felt like moments later. Although I was disoriented by the sudden interruption, I could make out the soft trudge of footsteps circling around to the front of the truck. They stopped right outside the door. I froze for a moment. Whether in terror or anticipation, I didn't know yet. Bang! Bang! A booming noise shook the entire truck as I stumbled over and off my bed. Bang! Bang! The noise grew louder and more intense as I hurried to put on my boots, my hands trembling with fear as I tried and failed to tie the laces. Who's out there? No response came. Better get out of here before I call the cops! The warning did nothing. The banging only grew fiercer. Someone or something was trying to break inside. I darted over to the seat and shoved the keys into the ignition. The truck buzzed to life and through the curtains I saw the front lights beam across the field. I'll run you over, boy! Now get off my truck! I shrieked as I threw open the curtains. In just a moment, I saw the figure of a man dressed in all black sprinting away. He was holding a hunting knife the size of my arm in one hand and a hammer in the other. I looked towards where he was running. A black car sat over in the far end of the field. As I went to pull off, I watched in horror as the man swiveled around. He was grinning. My skin rippled as he began dangling the knife in front of his face before his entire expression went numb. And he stood there, glaring at me as I drove away. I opened my window and shouted at him. Try that again and I'll gut you! His head cocked to the side. He suddenly burst into a sprint. Whilst bolting towards me, he began wailing and shrieking as he waved the knife and hammer around sporadically. I panicked. The engine stalled. The window was still partly open as I squirmed around trying to get the engine to return to the living. The noise stopped. I swiveled my head back around and leapt back in my seat as the man pressed his face up to the glass. His teeth were sharpened and there were visible gnashes on the inside of his mouth as he gnawed at the glass. I told you! Suddenly he started swinging the hammer. One hit smashed into the glass. It shook. I kept on trying to restart the engine. A second hit. The glass started to splinter. The engine rumbled and spluttered. The cabin stank of fuel and sweat. A third hit and the glass started to crack. His eyes were wild as he hammered away. The knife in the other hand scraped against the glass. A fourth hit. The engine whirred to life. 
The glass reached its breaking point and I slammed my foot against the gas. The truck jolted, knocking off the crazed weirdo. His hammer was left embedded into the glass as I drove out of the lay-by, straight out onto the road. In my wing mirror, I saw him walk out onto the road behind me. He stopped in the middle and stared. Once again, he dangled the knife in front of his face. Only this time, he pointed. Pointed towards me. Ever since, I have my routes planned. And in the rarest case, that kind of demon tries attacking again. They will be met with God's fury. And now keep a loaded rifle under my bed. I do hope that if that creature of a man comes again, that I will be able to exact the same trauma he left with me. Only his will be a waking nightmare of gunpowder and death. Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So, if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. I remember that at some point, I wondered what C was like. All I knew about him was that he was rich, and that he needed me to transport his wares with the utmost secrecy. I tried my best for the most part. I mean, my truck was old and quite worn down. A few things had fallen out of the trunk before, though I was able to salvage most of it. As long as it didn't snoop or allow someone else to see what I was carrying, C didn't care. I had only angered him once, but I preferred not to think about that. Imagining his distorted voice screaming at me through the phone still sent shudders down my spine. Okay, that's enough rambling to yourself, Jared. If someone saw you, they'd think you're going crazy. I mean, maybe I was. With my only connection to the world being C, it wasn't really much of a connection, honestly. There wasn't much for me to do. As my mother once said, I was a bum, a failure living out of my truck. No one really cared about me. Maybe that was why C was so willing to employ me. His jobs came with weird instructions and even stranger products, but he paid well. That was all that mattered to me. I shook my head at that, pushing the address into my fancy GPS device. C was the one that gifted to me a few years ago when he learned that I didn't have one. It was oddly good at guiding me through empty roads. Today's shipment was a bit weird. A single cover lay in my truck, tucked safely behind some blankets and other knickknacks. Apparently, it was very expensive. To me, it just looked cursed. When I moved it into the truck, the old antique wood made a shrill noise as if I was hurting it. Of course I wasn't. I was just doing my job. Not that I care as long as the boss pays me well. I huffed to myself, joking. Hands on the wheels, I started following the road to wherever I needed to go. I was over half a day from my destination, so I really needed to get going. If possible, try not to stop too many times in your way today, Jared. And please, be discreet about your cargo to the police. It's an antique. I wouldn't want them to destroy it because they think something is wrong with it. Okay, boss. That made sense to me. I'd encountered the cops a few times on the road and they were often quite clumsy. I still remember one time they broke a mirror in the back. I wondered if they ended up being cursed because of it. My grandmother used to be very superstitious. As if. Curses don't exist, only stupid cops do. The fact that those two were in an accident straight after letting me go finally had nothing to do with it. A weird loud noise broke me from my thoughts. At first, I thought that a tire had popped. Seriously? What the... As I made my way to the back of my truck, I realized that my precious cargo had somehow rammed itself against the hood. Trying to escape, are you? No answer came, of course. I couldn't help but chuckle a bit at that pushing the box behind some others again on the side. You know, sometimes I wish for a bit more fun. I love it if something crazy happened. But, well, sometimes boring is better, right? The next hour or so was mostly uneventful. I sang along to the radio, trying to keep cheerful. Somehow, I felt a bit down. It was hard for me to explain why, but I didn't want to keep driving on. Maybe I could take a small break. It wasn't the brightest idea, but anything was better than crashing because I fell asleep at the wheel or something. I'd seen it happen a lot and it really wasn't pretty. I pulled over to the side and hopped out of my truck, 
ready to walk around to feel a bit more alive. And that's when I heard it for the first time. Let me go! Let me go! Huh? Let me go! Let me go! I heard those words loud and clear, repeated again and again. But they sounded as if they were coming from inside. Inside my head. Okay, I must be going crazy. My phone buzzed again, and I couldn't help but roll my eyes a bit. I couldn't just drive for days without taking a rest. Still, I did feel a bit odd about C being so hands-on for once. Could you please hurry up? We really need your cargo. Did he know that I'd stopped for a break? Maybe he was tracking my GPS. Sorry, boss, but I need to take a quick nap. I'll be back on the road before you know it. C's text blew up my phone, so I just chose to ignore them. I knew that I might lose my job after that. But I just felt so tired, so off, that I knew I had no choice. I slept like a baby for a good five hours before hitting the road once more. Most of my rest was uneventful, save for some rustling that I heard from the outside. It was nice to be rested once more. Hitting the road again. Sorry, boss. C didn't respond which I didn't mind much. It was better to be scolded a bit later. However, I realized quite quickly that something was wrong. I caught myself zoning out again and again, driving past others faster than before. At some point, I drove for a solid hour without really taking in anything around me. I realized something was off when I saw the billowing smoke gathering in the sky above me. The sound of sirens was next. Police cars. There were five of them lined up behind me. What the... How did this happen? I knew I could blank out while driving, but this had never happened before. I... I felt as if I lost my connection to my body for a second. As if I were there, but unseen. It feels good, right? A low, raspy voice purred in my ear. I looked around again, hoping that there was someone in the car with me. That I wasn't just hallucinating. But I was on my own. No matter what you do, don't listen to him. Okay, Jared. Maybe, maybe you need more sleep than you thought you did. Yeah, that's it. Just stop the car, talk to the cops, and everything will be fine. Drive! I hit the gas harder than I ever had before, a shriek falling from my lips as I did so. <coughs> I wasn't in control, but I still felt bad. I didn't know why. Or maybe I did. I felt confused. All I knew was that my car was a lot more beaten up than before. My wheels were covered in what looked like red paint. Because there was no way it was something else, right? Yeah, that's the best way to explain. Confused and lost, trying to lift my leg off the pedals. But I was unable to do so. Jared White, you are under arrest for causing a mass accident. Please stop your car and... Voices echoed in my head. But all I could do was keep my hands on the steering wheel. I tried to shake it off. I tried to regain control, but there was no way for me to do so. That's it. I'm almost free. I saw it for the second time. Its face stretched, eyes large, wide, grinning at me in the rearview mirror as if it was just a friend, a passenger of mine. And then, then I saw the cliff coming. I tried to steer back onto the road, but it wouldn't let me. My only chance was opening the door and jumping out, which at the speed my truck was going felt dangerous. And yet, I knew what I had to do, but I didn't have time. I saw the people chasing me, their eyes wide in panic as my beloved truck hit the barrier. And then it all went black. I woke up in the hospital. I was fine. But the people it had hurt weren't, and I would live with that guilt forever. My story all started on the 10 freeway, heading through Los Angeles, when traffic came to a complete stop. This wasn't unusual. SIG alerts on the 10 were a common occurrence. However, that day was different. There was a fire nearby that prompted the entire freeway to shut down for several hours. For a person, driving a normal car being detoured off the freeway can be frustrating and annoying. To a trucker driving a 16-wheeler, it's a freaking nightmare. 
After a five-hour delay in bumper-to-bumper traffic, I was finally able to make my delivery and pick up a new trailer at Long Beach Harbor. My typical route has me driving from Austin, Texas to Long Beach, California and back, carrying who knows what. Typically, it's crap from China, like toys and housewares that discount stores sell. I don't usually pay attention to what's in the back unless it's live or needs refrigerating. On my way back, I opted to take the 91 freeway, which I had forgotten during certain times. I mean, most times it too was a nightmare, yet it still beat taking side streets around Los Angeles to get back on the 10. So, after another two-hour delay, I finally found smooth sailing into the desert. By this time, it was around 8 at night, and I was feeling the day wearing on me. Unfortunately, I had a schedule to keep, and nearly seven-hour delay in traffic had thrown my schedule way off. I knew it was against the rules and even the law for me to drive beyond my allotted hours, but I figured as long as I wasn't caught, I could make up some time if I drove through the night. I pulled into a gas station in Indio at a quarter past nine to fill up my tanks, grab a few Red Bulls and some dinner. I hated drinking Red Bulls because they always made me jittery, but it was the best way to assure I'd stay awake. As I walked back to my truck, I noticed a guy walking along the off-ramp, thumbing for a ride. Where are you heading? I called out. I had to call out a few more times because he couldn't hear me over the freeway traffic noise. He decided to come over instead to talk to me. Going? Oh, uh, Phoenix. I sure could use a lift. Picking up hitchhikers was frowned upon, but I had done it dozens of times before. It was one thing to listen to the radio, but to have someone talk to you during the drive was certainly a lot better. Well, hop in. I'm heading to Texas. You're on my way. I offered. He didn't hesitate to do just that. When I was about to head out, though, he remembered he left something back by the freeway. I didn't really want to wait, but I already told the guy I'd give him a ride. Ten minutes later, he returned with a backpack, like the one soldiers use in the military. You serve? I asked, pointing to the backpack. He grunted, his attention peeled to the side mirror. Two tours in Iraq. He returned, making it apparent he didn't want to talk about his time in the service. I never served. Bad back and all. Not that driving a truck ever helped that. What's taking you to Phoenix? I asked the guy. It's John, by the way. I offered my hand to shake. Mitch. He turned to me, scowling. I heard my old lady just had a kid. I doubt it's mine, but I thought I should check it out. He turned back to the side window, staring obsessively at the mirror. Oh, I was going to say congratulations, but I wasn't sure I should. For miles, he continued to watch the side mirror, not saying a word. His staring was starting to get to me, which caused me to ask, Are you watching for something in particular? Just then, the truck ran over something in the road, causing the steering wheel to jump into my hands. When I did, a loud thumping noise began to beat against the side of the cabin. I immediately thought I blew a tire, which wasn't a big deal because there was another tire on the same side to compensate. You might want to pull over. It sounds like you have a flat. Mitch mentioned several times, finally convincing me to check it out. As I slowed to pull over, Mitch kept watching the side mirror. We were in the middle of the desert and the only people that were around were in the cars passing us on the freeway. There was no moon that night, making it even more unnerving. Something about the way Mitch was acting by constantly looking at the side mirror put me on edge. I pushed away the thought, thinking that it might have been the Red Bulls messing with my head. I jumped down out of the cabin to inspect my rig, then suddenly, everything went black. When I woke, I was in the passenger seat of my cab. Once the fog cleared, I realized Mitch was driving. What the... The back of my head was throbbing like mad. You passed out. I thought I'd help by driving a few miles. Mitch said, his eyes shifting to the rearview mirror and to the side mirror far more than out the front window. I can't let you drive. It's... uh, It's against regulations. Pull over. I could lose my job if someone else was seen driving my truck. When I demanded that he pulled over, Mitch pulled a pistol from his backpack and aimed it at my face. I suggest you sit there, be quiet, and let me drive. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed bright red and blue lights shining on the road several miles behind us. Typically, I don't care much for cops, but when I saw those lights, I swear I could have hugged one. I'd suggest you pull over. You've got some friends on your tail. Friends? <laughs> right. Tell you what, once we make it past the state line, I'll drop you off somewhere. Dead or alive? I asked seriously, noticing the crazed look in Mitch's eyes. Mitch didn't respond. The police cars grew closer, surrounding my rig. I hadn't seen so many police cars in one place in all my life. What the hell did you do? Mitch laughed nervously. Shut up. Just... The gun went off, shooting through the passenger side window. The glass shattered, sending shards into Mitch's eyes. This gave me the chance to grab the wheel and pull over. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground with my hands behind my back. He took my rig! I'm, I'm just the driver! I yelled out, hoping they'd believe me. An officer helped me to my feet and uncuffed me while another held my license out. John Packard? He asked. I nodded. <laughs> were you aware you were transporting escaped felons in your trailer? The officer asked. The officer then showed me that the lock had been cut on my trailer. Mitch had arranged to pick up his buddies after they escaped. Why he didn't kill me, I'll never know. The police let me go after. A short time later, I noticed a sign by the side of the road. State prison. Don't pick up hitchhikers. Needless to say, I haven't picked up another hitchhiker since. <laughs>